el de la vino. So good evening to all. Uh, I extend my gratitude to Dr. Shutush and uh, Premas for inviting me to speak on multiomics and precision oncology today. I do not have any conflicts of interest to disclose. Now, cancer, as we all know, is a disease of uncontrolled rampant proliferation of cells in an organ or blood. It's rightly described as the modern disease par excellence and the quintessential product of modernity by eminent scientists. Yet, cancer is not a disease of the modern era. Now, to understand the relevance of precision medicine, let's take a quick look at the history of cancer. So the earliest report of tumors dates back to Egyptian era, but biology as a causal factor was recognized only by Hippocrates, who lived before 370 BC. Now, the earliest modality of uh, treatment was radical surgery, as you can say, where the affected organ or tumor was simply chopped off. The late 1800s then witnessed radiotherapy as a treatment modality, and mid-1900s saw the birth of chemotherapy. But the refined versions of these treatments strategies continue as foundations for cancer therapy, included as standard of care. However, rise in incidence of the disease, failure to attain complete cure, and advances in diagnostic methods have led to the development of targeted therapies solely based on molecular characteristics of tumor. As I mentioned, therapeutic strategies have evolved drastically to accommodate discrepancies in the overall survival rates and treatment success. Hence, we now live in the era of targeted therapy and immunotherapy. Now, let's see what the disease burden is like. This is a Globocan data showing global cancer mortality rates. Lung and breast, as you can see, the blue and pink shades, they dominate the stats with India's leading cause of cancer death attributed to cancer of the breast. Now, our country's numbers at a glance, within a population of around 1.38 billion, there were 1.32 million new cases and 8.5 lakh deaths due to cancer per, as per 2020 stats. Hence, we require massive efforts to actually curb the disease. The precision oncology is defined as molecular profiling of tumors to identify targetable alterations. This enables us to customize treatment on an individual basis. The foundation of precision oncology lies in deciphering the biology of cancer inside a patient. To that effect, we try to combine different strata of molecular signatures inside the cell. Now, omics, as you know, is comprehensive study of the roles, relationships, and actions of various types of molecules in cells. And multi-omics is the integration of these different omics in, in a single study or analysis pipeline. The various omic branches we popularly deal with are epigenomics, uh, in onco we call the oncomethylome, mostly genomics, where we deal with mutations, copy number variations, Transcriptomics, where we focus on overexpressed genes, fusions, miRNAomics, proteomics, metabolomics. There are a couple of other newer omic uh, branches, such as glycomics, lipidomics, phosphatomics, interactomics. The metagenomics and microbiomes are also part of the omic strategies, but I will not be covering those in today's session. Now, Multiomics considers the integrated cooperative functioning of an entire cell and its environment. For a protein or a metabolite to be formed within a cancer cell, the first step is believed to be chromatin remodeling, followed by transcription, translation, post-translation modifications, processing and transporting the protein by endoplasmic reticulum in Golgi and finally getting it to the targeted destination. But these processes, they are not standalone processes, they are interdependent and hence calls for a holistic approach in translation science. So the idea of multi-omics is that you don't focus on just one omic parameter, you take a holistic integrated approach. So you start from the epigenome and then work down the way assaying up to the protein and the metabolite. 
epigenomics. Um, these essays are not routinely ordered in clinical practice, but uh, yes, they are important as an MGMT promoter methylation. Uh, we do see, it's in, and it's inversely proportional to response to temozolomide and gliomas. MLH1 promoter methylation assay, which is important colorectal cancer. Now, uh, when you look at tests, available tests for breast cancer for ER positive node negative uh, CR breast, you have the Terascreen PITX2 RGQ PCR kit, where the ratio of methylated to unmethylated DNA in tumor sections is looked at, and the percent methylation ratio, PMR, which is indicative of overall survival and outcome when anthracyclines are combined with standard therapy, is looked at. For colorectal cancer, we have ColoGuard, which is an FDA approved screening test where uh, FIT plus amplification of methylated uh, BMP3 and NDGR4, along with beta actin methylate control and mutant KRAS, also used. The Colvera liquid biopsy test uses a methylated two gene panel, IIK, EZF1, and the PCAT1 to detect residual disease in post surgical resection for CRC. Now, these tests, uh, they are available, they are most of them are approved, but uh, we are unable to use them commonly in the clinic. For uh, project or uh, research purposes, we usually see the Illumina human methylation for TB chip assays. That is the data that we have commonly used. Now, epigenomic, uh, epigenomics is important when you look at certain therapeutic uh, uh, approaches. Uh, there are therapeutic targets which are approved, which is uh, already there in the clinic. So we have histone acetylase, HAT inhibitors. We have DNA methyl transferase, DNMT inhibitors. We have ubiquitin ligase inhibitors, histone lysine demethylase inhibitors, et cetera. So some of them are already in clinic and some of them are still under clinical trials. Moving on to genomics. The tumor mutational profile and CNAs are used frequently in the clinic. And uh, when you get a commercial report, an example is shown on the right-hand side of the slide. So MASH targeted therapy is usually displayed in all commercial reports. Now, uh, looking at the example, uh, this sample report shows uh, microsatellite instability, high, uh, high nine tumor mutational burden, and a plethora of mutations in so many different genes for this particular patient. So just by looking at it, you get an overall idea as to what pathways are involved. Now, ERID1A is part of the SWI SNF complex, which is associated with nucleosome prearrangement. We can target uh, ERID1A. There are certain clinical trials as well. BRCA2 is part of the HR uh, pathway. The CTNNB1 we know is part of the WINT pathway. Jack, the P10 uh, is part of the PIC3 CA pathway. So we have, this is uh, how a clinical report usually looks like. And uh, the, the variant frequencies would also be listed. So we uh, analyze this and then reach our uh, conclusion as to what targeted therapy to give. This is another sample report uh, of a colon adenocarcinoma patient where uh, Look, uh, just look at the number of mutations on the, on the lower half of the slide. So what, uh, apart from uh, just the number of mutations in targeted therapy, something else that this report uh, calls out is that uh, talks about tumor heterogeneity. So you have so many mutations, so many genes involved. Uh, that means tumor is highly heterogeneous and probably difficult to treat as well. Now, mutational signatures, they are actually blueprints of tumor genome causal factors. These are the outcome of cumulative actions of several mutagenic processes that operate over a patient's lifetime. So we derive, or we are able to derive mutational signatures by, from the entire mutational profile of a tumor. And, uh, but then for analysis, a whole genome sequencing or a whole exome sequence is actually ideal which we hardly get in the clinic. Uh, the standardized assay is for uh, WGS and WS, but uh, currently 
uh, they are trying to validate in smaller panels that are available commercially so that we we'll, we are able to uh, draw in signatures also for our precision onco services so this is an example where you can see uh, there's a double strand break uh, base pair mismatch so each individual causal factor will produce a particular signature the mutational signatures it's a very large concept difficult to be put into one slide but they are so important that they point towards the uh, causal factor of that particular tumor or maybe there may be a mixed uh, group of causal factors but uh, sometimes just one stands out maybe it's uv radiation maybe it's a, an alkylating alkylating therapy that stands out so by looking at the signatures that we derive uh, there are a lot of computational and mathematical processes that are uh, utilized to derive these signatures but by looking at such graphs or uh, outputs you can actually figure out what exactly was the reason uh, the tumor developed or what is actually happening in the tumor at that particular point of time this was our paper where we tried uh, signature analysis in breast and we showed that uh, we actually revalidated in the matter of fact that uh, c to t trans uh, uh, conversions were actually more common in breast cancer and uh, c to t are mostly spontaneous mutations now uh, signatures in breast for example you can see uh, whatever i have marked in red uh, just within a particular tumor cohort you can see the age related signatures apopic related signatures mmr deficiency hrd and even unknown etiologies so there are multiple signatures and each signature points towards a particular causal factor and in lung cancer apopic 3b uh, so this is a very interesting uh, utility of signatures you can see that when there is a, a, a lower expression of the apobex 3p there's a better better survival for patient plus the apobex are usually predictive indicators for immunotherapy as well so this is just uh, we don't use it uh, commonly in the clinic but uh, on a research basis yes it helps a lot the transcriptomics the tumor rna seq is definitely significant but significant potential in precision oncology overexpressed genes are studied as biomarkers for both resistance as well as sensitivity in triple uh, cancers uh, for example the aurora kinase a expression actually predicts chemo or platinum resistance and poor survival in high grade uh, cirrus ovarian cancers uh, this is a very uh, short list of mirnas that are implicated in uh, diseases like cll multiple myeloma and colorectal cancer that this is an exhaustive list and it's very difficult to shortlist uh, mirnas but i think hardly there are targets uh, target therapies available right now maybe not for cancer i know that sirna targets are available for other diseases now uh, those of you who are interested you could always go back check our uh, on the left hand side you have the i put in the link for our uh, database So this is the uh, mutation specific therapies resource and database called mustard uh, you will get info on therapies available for uh, overexpressed genes fusions and mutations in cancer below is our in depth review on uh, non coding rnas vesicles and microbiome in uh, colorectal cancer so those of you who are working in the field i guess will benefit from this these papers now moving on to the proteo the proteome is the most important component in my opinion as these molecules are actually implicated in driving the functional component whether be in health or in disease the most common uh, uh, proteins assayed in the cancer clinic are tumor markers we know so you can uh, use a quantitative assay or a qualitative assay and each uh, so these are examples uh, ca ca125 ca99 AFP, PSA, beta HCG. So, few examples that we have uh, that we do routinely in the uh, hospital, and each marker points to a specific cancer and is used for diagnosis or follow up. So, on the right hand side, you have a longer list, and uh, 
we do send in uh, these proteomic markers for uh, individual patients as and when required. Now, ma uh, mass spectrometry is the gold standard actually to analyze proteins and metabolites. It's actually even used to detect mutations in the tumor sample, as shown in the first figure on the right hand side. Uh, other common methods that we use are uh, chemiluminescence immunoassay, tumor markers, immunohistochemistry staining for tumor or organ specific protein capture, etc. Now, the metabolome is closely related to energetics of the cell, and oncometabolites do play a very crucial role in the initiation, progression, and regulation of tumor microenvironment. I'll just quote one example today. Uh, there's an infamous 2-hydroxyglutarate, which is a non-cometabolite produced by cells harboring IDH mutations. They're commonly seen in particular brain tumors, glioblastomas. They're also seen in AMLs, chondrosarcomas. Now, this molecule, the 2-HG, is capable of affecting and regulating multi-omic components of the cell, as you can see in the figure. And it is a very difficult uh, analyte to measure. Uh, or be quantified in the lab, but there's a downstream molecule called the lactate dehydrogenase or LDH, as we commonly call it, that which is easily measurable. So 2-HG is notorious in actually uh, regulating epigenomic uh, components as well as downstream signaling pathways. Other omics, uh, the additional omic branches, these haven't actually entered the clinic yet, but is of paramount importance in research. And of the lot, uh, I personally focus on the intractomics in most of my projects. Now, this is an outline of the work we presented at the ACR last month. Our team had used uh, supervised ML to analyze multiomic signatures in colon cancer. Actually, there are about 64 pipelines that will help in similar analysis, uh, which are actually available in the public domain as well. So uh, even if you run a multi-omic analysis on a available data set, uh, you will have to do an in silico validation and an experimental validation for the uh, findings to be uh, to hold true. This is another paper we worked on, uh, which distinguished uh, subtypes of invasive breast cancer based on uh, machine learning in multi Now I'll give you a, a brief overview of what I do in the clinic. Now, a surgical, medical, or a radiation oncologist diagnoses cancer in the clinic and then refers the patients to us for genetic counseling first in case of a suspected hereditary cancer or refers a patient with a genomic profiling report. Now, we then utilize the clinical and molecular and multiomic information, whatever info is available or whatever test the patient has undergone. We compile all the data, we utilize that, we work on it, and then we arrive at the best opinion on the mutation specific targeted therapy or immunotherapy suited for that particular patient. Our opinion is then sent back to the oncologist in a report form. Now, it is a decision of the patient and the oncologist to choose the therapy we suggest, or maybe defer or even reject. Ultimately, Formulating a good consult opinion depends on our clinical expertise, strength in cancer biology concepts, and proficiency in computational oncology or bioinformatics in general, because these are the foundations that we utilize to formulate a consult opinion on precision onco services. And these are few tools and sites that we commonly use for our services. So we go through all these. This, these are, this is just a very small list. There are numerous similar uh, tools and uh, sites available. So for every patient, you need to go through all that and then finally sit and decide or formulate the opinion. In a nutshell, precision oncology actually uh, utilize it. Uh, precision oncology needs utilization of all available omic data of a patient. Uh, whatever I've mentioned before, to be integrated into a single decision-making format to offer the best possible therapeutic option for a patient with cancer. Now, the challenge lies in generating data, managing financial toxicity for patients because these uh, essays are costly, 
uh, especially in the Indian setting, understanding tumor biology, foreseeing tumor heterogeneity, which is a very tough uh, hurdle for us. And also, you also need to think about access to targeted therapy. You give out an opinion as to use uh, the, this drug may be useful for the patient, but then if the drug is not accessible, it becomes difficult. So these are certain challenges that we face. Uh, yet uh, we have our services on and working well. Now I'd like to thank a few of my wonderful collaborators and friends here. Uh, great institutions I've been affiliated with uh, that has paved way for our team to establish affordable precision oncology services in India. So for um, official collaborations, you could always write to me uh, at my Harvard email, or uh, if you are looking for any short-term internships or in silico projects, you could uh, contact me at my institute email as well. It was a pleasure to be part of this initiative. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Anu, for your uh, uh, interesting talk. So I do see some of the questions right in chat box and also some of them came to me directly. So uh, uh, first question I would like to take, which is how does the multi-omics approach affects the success rate of precision treatment for patients in stable conditions? Okay, multi-omic approach. So as I mentioned, if you are just going to look at, suppose uh, a patient has a mutation in uh, a BRCA2 gene, so, and that is all you've looked for. You've just looked at BRCA1. So you found a mutation, you're very happy. You think the HR, there is an HRD and uh, you immediately start thinking about offering PARP uh, or PARP inhibitors. Now, uh, you are totally blind about the epigenomics of that particular tumor, as well as the downstream uh, omic test. What if the BRCA is actually silent or epigenomically silenced? That do happen. Uh, or what if you're going in for a PARP inhibitor? What if there is a mutation or a loss of function in the PARP as well? So you end up, uh, so there your patient choice becomes wrong. So unless we see everything, uh, it is quite difficult to use just one omic parameter and decide on a precision onco service or an I hope that's clear. Yeah. And second question is similar to that, like, uh, uh, I read a few literatures which suggest after targeting cancer-related genes using chemotherapy or immunotherapy, cancer attacks back after a few months with a new set of targeted genes. Uh, do you think multiomics can be effective for long-term survival of cancer? Yes, uh, that's a really great question. So uh, this does happen in a real-world scenario as well, where uh, you start on uh, a particular, you find an actionable target, be very happy. Uh, you think by targeting it, the cancer is just going to vanish. So it doesn't happen. So you, the patient will hold on for months. Uh, we have seen such cases as well. Patients doing well for months, but uh, inadvertently they come back uh, with a relapse. It's quite possible. Uh, now, not just multiomics, but uh, intractomics. That is what they lately. Um, focus on. So it's because uh, these mutations or even those mutations that cause therapeutic resistance, they don't act alone. They form kind of a kind of an established protein-protein uh, interaction network within the tumor. That is what gives the cancer uh, the ability to actually overcome uh, the drug that has been uh, uh, challenged with and then grow, grow again. So multiomics is a start. Uh, we'll have to uh, completely analyze from A to Z. We'll have to look at how the tumor genome is, not just the tumor genome, we also have to look at the tumor microenvironment because uh, immunotherapy is dependent on that. And uh, so that's a start. The multiomics is a start. But uh, the day that we are able to uh, stabilize or curb the intracto, that is when you will be able to successfully put in a uh, halt on the cancer. So Dr. Anu, when you talk about interactome, how big is human interactome? Like what, how many proteins or genome we are talking about here? Uh, some figures, they look like the motherboard of a, <laughs> you know, a workstation. It's, okay. uh, 
literature is really huge so i don't think they can, you can't even uh, sort of uh, put in a number for that matter so it's that so much of cross talk that happens between uh, each component but uh, what we can uh, practically do is that try in and filter the dominant components or the dominant signaling pathways and then target them so that the others become just noise and you uh, chop off the trunk uh, you can target the <laughs> branches and roots hopefully so we talk about multi omics approach i mean there are like we're talking about various kinds of data sets right so what do you think is the current barrier uh, which is slowing the deployment of personalized medicine by utilizing multi omics approach yeah the first and foremost is the financial barrier especially in our setting so our patients still are not able to afford uh, even a small panel of uh, you know uh, so talking about multi omics becomes a very far fetched uh, uh, fancy chemical <laughs> theory but uh, i guess by increasing awareness if the consumers and the number increases if more and more doctors or clinicians and scientists if they keep ordering more and more i guess uh, the cost would come the cost has come down i agree yes but uh, for our patients to afford needs to come down a little more so we need collaborative services as well single centers or multiple centers and just centers across the country that can help analyze you know the weeds so that they can pull and work on a better cause cause so that is the first barrier second barrier i would say is um, awareness that's what we are trying to create here we need more clinicians patients they need to be aware that uh, something like precision oncology is there for their benefit uh so we have these lectures and uh, a lead stuff to do that then um yeah i guess this th third one i guess would be expertise you have data but then you hardly can figure out what it is so uh you you are not supposed to actually treat the mutation per se you have to look at it at a uh, in a birds eye view and then see uh understand how the tumor is or how aggressive the tumor is the one that's sitting in front of you and then decide on what um, the best option is so these three i would uh, say are the barriers and also i think like bringing different experts in one platform would also be a kind of challenge i guess because it's like we are talking about a multiple uh, you know uh, uh, omics group and we all can come together and make a one platform where yeah. we can offer services or help patient with that uh, yes. so and, and one more thing i think uh, about data analysis and storage would be another uh, thing uh, yes. uh, road block right so when you talking about like say for indian population so when every year we are thinking about zeta uh, bytes of data like 10 to the power 21 you no know, uh, bytes we are talking about which might go up to you know yotta byte or something we are talking about so how do you store it and all those things so yeah. looking at that i mean do you think that like there is a, also a, 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 a relevance of artificial intelligence in multi omics approach to reach a clinical interpretation like to combine all those uh, groups together we can put in artificial intelligence which can combine data from different streams and give a streamlined uh, 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 analysis for those reports or something do you think it is something yeah. which would... uh, uh, yes so as you rightly pointed out uh, uh, that is another challenge but a workable challenge so for our research purposes we use uh, service to Uh, i'm not a bioinformatician we have uh, bioinformaticians in our uh, team and uh, my collaborations are mostly with the csir igibt uh, we have wonderful computational oncologists there so we use those uh, you know hardcore uh, workstations and servers to get these analysis done but i cannot use our laptops or i mean we've had uh, laptops crashing uh, <laughs> because of the <laughs> massive amount yes 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 we've had a lot of uh, uh, stories of laptops crashing <laughs> uh, so uh, right now in my clinic we have our own uh, bioinformatician and uh, our own workstation which is going to come now so uh, yeah that requires a little bit of uh, computational power and uh, money there yes so but it's a doable thing it's not you know unachievable great 
I see a couple of more questions here. So uh, next question is, how do you identify the drug targets? Do you incorporate genetic interactions, GIs? Um, um, apart from GIs, what more uh, you do identifying the drug targets? Could you throw some light on it? Yeah, so um, if you or if the patient already has a report, the report itself would have a, a display of actionable targets and we know, uh, for example, big 3 c if the patient has a high VAF, big 3 c mutation, you know there's a drug alpha listable there. So with experience, you get to know what targeted therapy is there, actually. Um, and uh, interactions on a day-to-day -day case basis, I actually don't, uh, but yes, it's not that I really don't look at it. I do look at it because, um, as I said, no, the pathway would be intact, but there would be some external inhibitor that is blocking. So there would be no point in actually targeting the pathway. So that is what, uh, if you ask me, uh, how do I go at step by step? Um, I initially I look at the clinical data and I formulate how the patient is you know, in my head. Okay, this patient is in this particular condition. Uh, and we also look at how many, you know, is the post therapy or treatment name. We usually get post therapy patients, patients who have failed chemotherapy or radiotherapy or maybe post surgical, etc. So, uh, and then you go, then I go back and look at the molecular signature. Sometimes I ask the company for to get the mutational signatures, which will give me a little bit uh, better idea on if I have to use immunotherapy or not. And then. Uh, variant by variant, we analyze. So I basically look into everything that is related to the variant, uh, clinical studies, guidelines, FDA approvals, uh, preclinical studies, everything. So, and then finally reach a opinion as to what is the most important uh, targetable uh, factor in that particular patient. And finally, before offering, uh, you know, before saying this drug or this pathway can be targeted, we cross-check whether the patient can actually be given that particular therapy or not. And that is how we go about it. Excellent. Uh, uh, there's one more question. Uh, question is uh, knowing the financial restraint. I mean, it's getting back to the same uh, this, uh, point what we discussed a few minutes ago. We all face which patients from a clinic clinician perspective uh, are your prime target for applying the multi units approach? Yeah, that's Kurt. Hello, Kurt. He is my uh, uh, friend, Harvard batchmate, and uh, co author now. Okay. So okay. great to see you here. And uh, yes, I do agree. We all face the financial restraints. So as of now, uh, these uh, multi-omic approaches or even genomic approaches are reserved for patients who have no other option. You know, so patients are mostly, uh, more than clinicians or uh, you know, others, we usually have patients requesting for assays, asking for you know, one more drug or something that would be able to you know, extend patients and bystanders in fact. So uh, I think currently, and those, and we should be able to actually filter as to which type of panel or which type of assay you can ask with respect to how much the patient can afford. I do that when I uh, get consults, I actually do, can you afford this assay or this panel? If they say yes, then okay, we'll go for the best. If not, we will bring it down uh, to a notch and then offer. So as of now, but uh, we, I hope in the future or in the, at least in the nearby future, we will get uh, upfront uh, molecular assays. That is our target. Great. Uh, so for Indian perspective, like, uh, you know, we have a lot of people working in various domains. So, I mean, we just discussed about challenges, roadblocks, what we get in these kind of studies. So according to you, uh, what should be done? Like, how can you, can we bring all those people who under one umbrella and also the, like some who wants to collaborate with you for their you know, studies around cancer? And how can we bring all of these people together under one umbrella? Do you have any, yeah. any suggestions or any points to mention here? So from what we have seen in the past year, I think, uh, uh, commercial companies, everything under a single umbrella in the private sector may be difficult. Um, uh, maybe the government, uh, under the government sector, probably it would uh, be a little more hassle-free. 
so that is what we are uh, thinking about and um, and if there are centers that can pull in samples and run at you know so as you know when the number of samples increases you can uh, cut down that as well as cut down the cost so rather than smaller 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 institutions doing their own small panels formulate larger panels and uh, maybe a couple of centers in uh, important cities or something uh, instead of you having to send your samples outside india so formulate such centers within india i'm not sure about the private sector but uh, and also um, we should be able to build a national database as well clinicians and scientists should come together that is very important uh, we've been advocating this for quite some time to put in de identified data so uh, data privacy is very important genomic data is sensitive data so uh, the patient must know that the their de identified uh, variant information is going into a particular portal just as you see tcga and uh, something similar to that our country also needs that i hope uh, companies like illumina will uh, you know put an effort sure. and <laughs> sure sure so i think with this we are end of our question answer session uh, and one final question uh, a question for a personal question <laughs> so what next at your end like what are your plans around multi omics and how are you going to bring people together uh, at your institute and uh, what are the collaborative efforts you are making yeah oh yeah we have extensive collaborations um uh i think uh, right now uh, we just taking baby steps because my first hurdle is to create the awareness and make uh, patients as well as clinicians aware of uh, the utility and the use and the uh, of precision onco so that takes a little time so little by little we're doing that then um, you know expand maybe get uh, i mean we do have uh, collaborators asking for a sample so the data privacy is a little uh, you know Uh, difficult that part is a little difficult to handle when you have a uh, multi omic plus we need to there are so many pipelines we need to standardize we need to create our own we need to create models so computational stuff is there uh, that has to be worked on so we would do that at the same time so we're trying to balance between clinical service as well as research and uh, most important part i would say is bringing up good hypothesis for projects mm -hmm. not just blindly going about multi omic analysis but we need to do something that is actually useful for the patient which can be translated easily into the clinic so collating data it will take a little time but uh, i think further down the lane we will create a scaffold and we will create an uh, algorithm of a sort to how as to how to analyze multi omic data and you know reach a personalized uh, opinion so these are the ideas that we have also we <laughs> we we all i'm also working with the nasa team for uh, multi omics in space biology so probably will connect both as well we are having yeah. efforts to do so so yeah exciting times ahead <laughs> Uh, thank you for being here i think there are no more questions in chat box so i would like to wind up here thank you dr anu for such an insightful talk we are looking forward to having you again for any such event in future and thank you very much for being part audience for being part of this webinar uh, please reach out to us with ideas and suggestions we would like to be part of any such program and love to extend support required from all the sides so thanks again uh, the speakers the attendees and uh, everyone else who became the part of this uh, entire exercise and please take care of yourself have a great evening now and the uh, upcoming days thank you very much have a have a great day ahead bye bye thank you